there, it's Chris Clements again, here to chat with you about empirical formulas and molecular formulas. This will be another brief one, so just take a listen, take a look at the uh, slides, and enjoy. Alrighty, an empirical formula is the simplest ratio of atoms in a formula, meaning all ionic compounds exist as empirical formulas because if you recall I always tell you that you need to reduce your subscripts in ionic compounds so every time you see an ionic compounds formula you are looking at the empirical formula the simplest ratio a molecular formula however I've told you do not reduce subscripts that is why we have over six million molecular compounds because we don't reduce subscripts when we reduce subscripts, we change the properties of a molecular compound. An example is the molecular formula of glucose, you should recall from biology, is C6H12O6. If I reduce that to its smallest ratio, it is CH2O. Well, we know glucose and its properties. It's a carbohydrate, simplest carbohydrate basic building block of our ATP, form of energy in our bodies. CH2O is um, known as formaldehyde, which you might recall is used as an embalming agent, thought to be a carcinogen as well. So get a tickle out of that one. So an empirical formula, again, is the simplest whole number ratio. The molecular formula, as I gave you, the molecular formula of glucose is some whole number multiple of the empirical formula. So if I look at the empirical formula of glucose as being CH2O, and I know that its molecular formula is C6H12O6, then the molecular formula is six times the empirical formula of glucose. Okay, I'm going to start off by giving you a problem. We're just going to work through it. There's a certain methodology to working through these problems that I strongly suggest you abide by. You can work them other ways, but boy, I'm telling you, you can get lost in a hurry on it, and you need to show me all of your work as you do so. So if you read this slide, it tells you a compound contains only carbon, hydrogen, and chlorine. The sample is known to contain 49.67% carbon, 1.39% hydrogen, and 48.92% chlorine. The molecular weight of the compound is 289.90 grams per mole. I want to know what the empirical formula and the molecular formula of the compound are. Little side note there is a molecular weight of a compound is the molar mass of the molecular formula. So you find the molar mass of the molecular formula and that is also called the molecular weight. To go about solving this problem, the first thing you do, having been given the percentages of the components of the compound, is make an assumption that you have 100 grams of the compound. That will make your math much easier. If you have 100 grams of the compound, then think about how many grams of carbon you would have in that particular sample. Of hydrogen, of chlorine, correct, I hope you guessed. You would have 49.67 grams of carbon, 1.39 grams of hydrogen, and 48.92 grams of chlorine. What I want you to do at that point is using that assumption that you have 100 grams of the compound, take each of those grams of the component elements and convert them into moles. You should know how to do that at this point. Going from grams to moles, one needs to use the molar mass of that particular element. So you look up the molar mass of carbon, the molar mass of hydrogen, the molar mass of chlorine. Nothing exists diatomically when it's within this compound. Remember that seven diatomic elements are only diatomic when they exist by themselves in nature. So I am therefore going to set up a little dimensional analysis or unit conversion problem from grams to moles where I take 49.67 grams of carbon multiplied by one mole of carbon over 12.01 grams of carbon. My grams of carbon divide out and I will get moles of carbon. I do the same thing for the hydrogen. I multiply by one mole of hydrogen over 1.01 grams of hydrogen for the chlorine, one mole of chlorine over 35.45 grams of chlorine. I want you to make certain that you round your moles to three significant figures. So as you do your calculation, and yes, I want you to use a calculator, 
you'll find that you get 4.14 moles of carbon, 1.38 moles of hydrogen, and 1.38 moles of chlorine. Your next step, and again, abide by these steps. Your next step is to divide each of the moles that you've just obtained by the smallest number of moles that you've just obtained. So I'm going to divide each of the moles that I've obtained by 1.38 moles, since that is my smallest value. 4.14 moles of carbon divided by 1.38 moles. Notice it's not moles of anything. 1.38 moles of hydrogen divided by 1.38 moles. 1.38 moles of chlorine divided by 1.38 moles. Once you get your quotients from that division, I want you to round again to three significant figures. If you can round at this point to a whole number based on some goofy rounding rules that I'm about to give you, then you may do so. The rounding rules indicate that if your number that you've obtained, once you've divided by your smallest number of moles, is equal to or less than something point two, you may round down. So for example, if I had gotten, once I divided by my smallest number of moles, 3.15, that is less than or equal to 3.2, and I can round it down to three as a whole number. If what I get when I divide by my smallest number of moles is equal to or greater than 0.8, then I may round up. For example, if for the carbon I had gotten 2.8, I would round that up to 3. If it is anywhere in between, that is where it gets a little tweaky and goofy. When it is in between 0.2 and 0.8, you will have to find a whole number that you will multiply each of your moles by in order to make them roundable according to these rules. So for example, if I had gotten 1.5 for my uh, whole number per se of carbon, 1.5 is between 1.2 and 1.8. I cannot round down, nor may I round up. So I then start to multiply by some number that makes it roundable. I find that I can multiply it by 2 and it gives me 3.00. When I find the number that works, I multiply each of the other elements by that number. So I would then multiply each of the other elements, in this case hydrogen and chlorine, number that I got by 2. I'll have you work an example of that in just a bit. The problem that I've given you, however, did not involve your having to do that multiplying trick you'll notice that you were able to round the whole numbers and you got a ratio of three carbons to one hydrogen to one chlorine. What you've just gotten then is your empirical formula. The next step, since I asked you for both the empirical and molecular formulas, is to determine the molar mass of the empirical formula, which is known as the empirical weight. So just take C3 HCl as your empirical formula and determine its molar mass. When you do so, you'll find that it is 72.49 grams per mole. Recall that I told you that the molecular formula is always some whole number multiple of the empirical formula. That means that the molecular weight will always be some whole number multiple of the empirical weight. Recall that I gave you the molecular weight. So now you will divide the molecular weight that you've been given by the empirical weight that you just calculated. And at this point, you should definitely get a roundable number. When you do so, you are going to get four. And what that means is that your molecular formula is four times your empirical formula. So that your molecular formula, when you take your empirical formula and multiply each of your subscripts by four, becomes C12H4 
Cl4. I want you to feel comfortable going back over any of these slides for a little review before you work this next problem. The next problem tells you that a compound consists of 43.6% phosphorus and 56.4% oxygen. It has a molecular weight of 283.88 grams per mole. I would like to know what its empirical formula and molecular formula are. Okay, hmm. I'm going to let you work that one out while I pause everything and give you a chance. And yep, you should find that you end up with an empirical formula of P2O5 and a molecular formula of P4O10, meaning your molecular formula is two times your empirical formula. The name of P4O10, by the way, just for kicks, is tetraphosphorus decoxide. Alrighty, you've been given two empirical and molecular formula problems to work. There are plenty more on my website, and they're not too difficult. I'm just going to be pretty consistent with your problem solving technique. Have fun with them. Hope you keep loving chemistry. Bye.